want to say hello to everyone online. We want to um, thank all those for joining us. We want to say hello to Life Chapel. Uh, I don't know if they're getting rain down there like we are getting some rain, but, um, you know, may, may the Lord, as Megan was praying earlier, may he pour out his blessings, maybe not the physical rain, but um, his blessings on us. We're talking about today, Megan, Megan already uh, briefly touched on it, is uh, the Beatitudes. Beatitudes, if you, you go to Matthew 5, we're, we've been going through this, um, and we're in part four, we're in the fourth Beatitude. These are the um, blessed are statements that are in the Bible, one of the most famous sermons of all time. Um, if you ever get a chance to actually research it, look at it, figure out where did he preach this sermon, what was going on around it. I mean, it's, it's so powerful and dynamic, but we're just gleaning and pulling out these scriptures and we're looking at them and, and, we're, and we're just speaking um, life into this congregation for this. Nick, can you turn me up just a little bit? Um, so before we move forward and, and as we're introducing the fourth choice this week, um, we're going to have all of these available for you on a CD. We have some of them. I think uh, choice one and two are available on a CD. You can uh, see Nick or myself to be able to get those. Uh, what ends up happening is we used to be able to uh, immediately burn the CD, but we changed how we record them right now, and it goes on to a computer drive, and then it has to be converted so it, it's not available instantly. So if you want to ask us for the CDs, we can get them to you, but it just takes a day or two to convert all of the files for that. So we can sum up the first three weeks. Uh, week one was this, I can't. That was the reality choice, I realize. I'm not God, um, and there's news right there. I admit basically that I'm powerless uh, to control my tendency to do wrong. Has anybody really stood in front of a strong, strong, um, you know, uh, a step towards a, a sinful uh, choice or whatever it is, and you stood there like a champ and were like, there is no sin that can overcome me, and you just turn the other way? No, a lot of times we fall prey to it, right? And we admit that there's, there's not really any power that I can self-will myself um, in this way. Yesterday, uh, Andy Davis, our, our drummer, he got married to Loretta. They had a beautiful, beautiful wedding, but they had an amazing dessert table. And I said, I will only eat one brownie. Five brownies later, I was still saying, I'm only eating one brownie at a time. But, you know, like, so... I am powerless to control my tendency to do wrong in my life. My life is unmanageable. I need God, right? I need him. So week two, uh, first, the first week is I can't. Week two is God can. This is what we call the hope choice. It says, I earnestly believe that God exists. It's amazing how many people I talk to, and, and, and I'll talk to them, and, and, and they ask the question, and they're like, well, do you believe in God? And I say, yeah, don't you? And, and they try to just like, I don't know. But we realize that God can, they, we believe that he exists. Not only that, but I matter to God as, as Jesus died on the cross for us, that we realize that he took value in dying for our sins so that we could be made whole, that I matter to him. Something very valuable, powerful uh, happened, and that by doing what Jesus did, he gives me the power to change, okay? Remember, my life is unmanageable, but I do have power in Jesus' name to change. So, um, I can't, God can, and then week three was let him. This was the commitment choice that we were talking about, and hopefully you practiced it this week. Megan had preached last week on the commitment choice, and here's what it says. It's basically, I consciously choose to commit, all right? to commit all my life and my will to Christ for his care and his control. I let him. I let go. I let God. And that's what we mean by this. Just let go and let God. All right? So we're coming into the fourth week right now. And I want to, I want to share with you some of this that years ago, um, after a Bible camp that my sister-in-law went on, we went down to Virginia and we were going to visit my in-laws and that morning I got up, I was really hungry, and I went to the refrigerator, and on an eight by 10 piece of paper sideways was this statement 
written on there. Now, I was hungry. I wanted food, but it quickly changed. And it says, Satan wants you more than you want God. I'm not hungry anymore, right? Satan wants you more than you want God. And that was a, a truth that she brought home from this, from this Bible camp there. And man, there's so much there that Satan wants you. He wants control of your life. He wants to distract you. He wants to detour you. He, he wants to create dysfunction and all kinds of things in your life so that you do not make a choice to follow God. So that you don't make a choice to make that commitment choice each and every day that you can become distracted. Well, you know, I got a job and I got this and I got that. Oh, I've been through this before. No, that's okay in my life, right? One of the biggest things is, like, like this morning, we, we had talked about this morning, uh, our dog came in from, from outside, he went to the bathroom, and he, and he ran downstairs, into, uh, she ran downstairs into the basement, and um, as she ran back upstairs into the house, she was incredibly wet, despite the rain, she was incredibly wet, and I was like, what's the deal, why is she so wet? So she ran back downstairs and came back up, and she was even more wet, and I was like, there can't be anything wrong. Come on, right? There can't be anything wrong. Just last night, Megan and I were in the basement on the shelf looking for her teacher certificate about midnight last night, and it was perfectly dry. And I think to myself, I take an inventory and say, there's nothing wrong. There can't be anything wrong. Nothing can be wrong. In our spiritual lives, we do that time and time again, but yet there is some type of major detour, dysfunction, detriment that is happening in our spirit, and we choose to willingly say, there's nothing wrong. I go downstairs, and after 30 gallons of pumping water, it's still wet, you know, like, there's something wrong, and we just can't go on, no, I'm okay. How many of us do that in our spiritual life? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't need to do this. Oh, I've done something like this before. Oh, yeah, when did you do that? Oh, 10 years ago I did that. What could happen in 10 years, right? Maybe North Korea could be ready to get rid of nuclear disarmament. You know, like, I, I don't What could happen in 10 years? We could have Donald Trump as our president, but yet 10 years ago say, that would never happen in a million years. What happens in your spiritual soul? We need to come to a place on a regular basis where we ask the hard questions. Am I okay? What's God doing in my life? Where have I blocked God in my life? You say, how do I let God? What, what does that statement even mean you said there? How can I let God make changes in my life he wants to make in my life? How do I do that? That's what leads us to the fourth choice that, that we're talking about here, that we're going to talk about, and it's probably the most difficult choice of all. So you say in, in, those, um, in those times saying, okay, the first three have been a little bit difficult. Maybe, maybe two of them have been difficult. One of them definitely has. And I'm telling you, today is the most difficult choice of them all. And you're like, thanks. It's pouring rain. We have a lake of full gospel in the back here today. You know, it's pouring. And the toughest choice is called the house cleaning choice because a lot of us, we resist the urge to get rid of junk, right? Any of you? I only have to come home with you and open up your garage, right? And you go, well, I'm keeping that for this, and, and well, I'm keeping this for that, and I'm, I'm keeping this for that. I, I forget the, the one house show that used to happen, um, and they went into people's houses to reorganize, and they had a giant tarp that was like trash, save and sell and and it was so funny that they they would have the first part of the episode that literally people would move the entire house and put it in the save pile and and the guys are like no this isn't happening you're gonna sell over half of this and half of it is going to be trash and they're like no and and they would start pu pulling out like bubblegum wrappers and all kinds of things and and sentimentality and and, and they're going that's garbage, that's refuse, that's trash. And they're going, no, but I got to keep it. And, and they would have these uh, come to Jesus moments with it and go, no, you need to get rid of that. So before we even get into that, we'll be honest with each other here. All of us have failed, right? All of us have failed. All of us have blown it at some point in time or another. All of us have sinned. 
Nobody's perfect. A huge Marvel comic fan, maybe Captain America could be perfect. I don't know. You know, he always makes the right choice. But the Bible says this in Romans 3, uh, 23. All of us have sinned. To help with that come into our mind, it said you've sinned, you've fallen short of God's glory. Not just that you've sinned, but you've fallen short because a lot of times I can just say, oh, well, I, I sinned and I keep it in my wheelhouse kind of. This is a choice I made. I let myself down or, or something like that. Well, the second part of the scripture, man, it brings God into perspective and it says, God is there with you and you've fallen short of the glory that he wants for your life. All right, now that makes kind of an icky moment. Anyone? Right? Oh, I can sin all the time as long as I don't connect it with God and fall in short and his glory and the greatness that he has for me. But man, when I connect it in that scripture, so the house, house cleaning choice, basically it is this. I openly examine and I confess my faults to myself, to God and to someone I trust. You're going, hold on a second. Hang on a minute. I didn't sign up for this kind of stuff. I admit something to myself, that's okay. Sure, I guess I can probably do that. Admitting to God, okay, I struggle with that a little bit. But for me to bear my soul to anyone else, especially in this church, yeah, not going to happen. Not going to happen. I just want to relax. I just want to come to church. I don't want anybody to get into my life or anything like that. But the Bible actually says in James, it says confess one to another. That means two people at least confess their sins to one another. And it says in there that, that if there is a two plus two equals four, it said if you want to have healing in your life, it says in the Bible there, it says confess one to another so that you may be healed. How many times do we come up secretly and we come to the altar and we sit and we pray and, and we just quietly in our mind don't say anything out loud and try and sort of handle it with God? And then we leave it there and we never go back to it whatsoever. The Bible actually talks about that true um, Christianity actually has where people are holding one another accountable. Not judgment. We have, we have pedigree in the church with judgment, right? We have multiple degrees in judgment. Not judgment, but accountability. John and I are going out to lunch together and we're talking and he's saying, hey, Pastor Tim, you know, I struggle with this area and I've fallen short in this area. And I go, yeah, John, you know, I've been struggling with this area. And I talk to him and then we pray about it at that point. John now has the opportunity to come back to me and say, hey, Pastor Tim, how are you doing in this area? Not for judgment or to cast conviction, but because he cares about me. Anyone? Because he cares about me, and he wants the best for my life, which is God's best. And in order to do that, man, there's got to be some house cleaning that happens. I come back to John, I say, hey, John, you know, I've been watching, things have been really rough in your life, and jobs been all over the place. How are you doing with this area? And it's not for me to have that giant, you know, Donkey Kong hammer out and smash them. But it's for me to say, I want the best for you. And we have to have some vulnerability there. So God is asking us to be honest, honest with him, honest with ourselves, and honest with people around us. It's because of freedom is possible, church. We're at Memorial Day. Freedom is possible. It's not National Barbecue Day, right? Come on. Tomorrow is not National Barbecue Day. It is Memorial Day. For us to remember those who sacrificed, who made it out alive, but greater than that are those who sacrificed and gave their lives so that we can have an America that we call free. We need to examine and talk about what truly is freedom. I tell you what Satan wants to do. He constantly, constantly wants to put you in bondage. He wants to put you in bondage by the things that you do, 
the, the little bad habits that you have, the, the, the little hurts that have been in your life, the abuses that have happened where they want you to blame one person and one person only, God. God, you've done this to me. Anybody ever de dealt with one of those in your life? Come on, right after a funeral, my mom dying, all kinds of different things like that, and people are like, God's in this. Shut up. What's God in it with my mom dying? Right? At that point, you start turning kind of ugly inside. You're just like, no, God has nothing to do with it. Actually, God allowed what? He allowed this to happen. He didn't intervene. What, why should I serve a God that doesn't intervene? Anybody ever had this stuff? Come on. To be real. The Bible says in John 8.32, when you know the truth, it'll set you free. It will set you free not believe in the lies and the distraction and all of that, that that Satan wants to get your eyes off of the Lord. In other words, truth is the cost of freedom. When I sat on an altar and I had an opportunity to make a decision to ask Jesus to come into my life, here was the radical truth that stood in between me and my freedom. I had to admit that I was a sinner. I was in a place of years of rebellion, years of doing the wrong thing, years of sinning. It piled up and piled up and piled up. And I sat at that one point, and my freedom would cost this, that I would have to swallow truth, right? You're a sinner, Tim. You have fallen short of the glory of God. And until I actually adjusted my reality, I couldn't come to know Jesus. Jesus couldn't set me free as a result. But in that moment, I faintly just sort of gave over and said, okay, I could believe that I'm a sinner. So I accept you, Jesus. Man, my freedom came rushing in. Anyone? Came rushing in. Freedom is the reward of truth. Freedom is the reward of honesty. You can't stand there at an altar to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and lie. Oh, Lord, I'm a really good person. I do everything correct, God, right? And Jesus is like, man, you're coming to me. I should come to you, right? <laughs> you're the Savior. So if we want to be free from all of this stuff that we're carrying around in our life, it begins with an honest conversation. And unless we're ready to be honest, with God and with people around us, it's not going to happen. That's why it's called, the, uh, in Life's Healing Choices, it's called the house cleaning choice. That if we do this weekly, if we do this monthly, if we do this type of choice daily, being able to be honest, and it will help us to live a holier life than we have ever, ever, ever achieved on our own. Doesn't it sound incredible to you? For me, I'm like, yeah. God, that's the type of Christianity that I would like to live. I'm, I'm tired of the low-level living of Christianity, right? What do I need to do, God, the least to keep me in the kingdom of God? Anybody? Right? What's the least requirement that I need to do to keep my salvation? That's, that's kind of for years. That's what I kind of weighed out all the time. What do I need to do the smallest amount? So here this weekend, this is what we're talking about. We want to bring you hope. We want to bring you courage. We want to help you to take steps going forward. Um, anybody know 1 John 4.18, what that scripture says? It talks about that perfect love cast out fear. One of the biggest fears that we deal with over and over and over again is this fear. If people truly find out who I am inside, they won't want me. Is that not a huge fear? right? When I go into a new job, I have a clean slate. People don't know all of the bad stuff about me, right? Come on, Anthony, right? And you're laughing about that, but it's true. Like, we're, we're in that place. And until they start finding out some of this stuff, but we're in that place, as long as nobody finds out the, the, the warts and the bad habits and the different situations like that, I'm going to be okay, but we need to take steps for this, to explore God's love. We're afraid of ourselves being found out to be frauds. And some of us are like, I'm not a fraud. I didn't know that we were perfect. 
Because if we truly understand all of the different things, we do have compartments in our spirit where we push things away. We don't adequately deal with them. You say, no, 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 I'm good. Okay, when was the last person who died in your life? I'm sure that there's some ugliness that happened somewhere in your family that really, truly wasn't dealt with right. I know situations where at the coffin, people have slapped each other, pushed each other, screamed at each other at the coffin. And then afterwards, they pretended like everything was okay for years, right? Come on. None of you live in that type of family? Matthew 5.8, it talks about this. Happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That is the fourth beatitude. The first thing that I want to notice, what it doesn't say is, it just didn't say, happy are the religious hearts. It doesn't say that. If you're religious, then, then you will be content. It doesn't say that. It says, happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Some of the most unhappy people that I know are the most religious people that I know. Come on. You've never met those people. I'll introduce you to some of them, right? The most religious spirits. We we had a, a gentleman who used to come to our Bible studies when I was a kid, and I was struggling with a relationship with Jesus, I would go into the kitchen and my parents and everybody were there and there was a gentleman that was there who could actually memorize all of the Bible and he would come back. He was the ugliest, nastiest man in that room. And I would stand back in judgment and say, if that's what being a Christian is like, why do I, you know? And, and I, would, I would come by, I'd make something in the microwave or whatever and walk like right through the edge of the Bible study and, and go watch, you know, a sports game or something like that and saying, no way, not me. That's just nasty and people are arguing and fighting and all kinds of things like that. No, that's not very good. Some of the most religious people that I know are miserable. Miserable. They won't be happy until everybody else around them is miserable. Right? Right? that's when they get some happiness. I'm miserable, so you've got to be miserable too. Anybody know anybody like that? Don't say the names, right? Their whole life is a bunch of rules. Anybody? When I first came to to, uh, think about accepting Jesus, I had the biggest uh, time, uh, the most difficult time sorting out everything that some of these people are telling me, some religious people are telling me about all of the don'ts. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. You as a young man, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And I'm going, where's the freedom part? Where's the Jesus as my Savior part? And I struggled and said, if that's what Christianity is about, I don't want it. Because there's plenty of other parts of life that I can go down, and they will allow me to sin freely. They just talk about a good time, right? And they'll allow me to do these things. No, 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 no. That's all I got. They want you to think um, that what life in Christ is all about is a bunch of no's and don'ts. But that's not what it's about. The Christian life is not about don't. The Christian life is about do, actually. It isn't about you can't. It's actually about you can The Christian life is not about no, it's actually about yes. If you, uh, in your Bibles, John 10, 10, love this scripture. Jesus said this, I have come in order that you may have life. Not just okay life. Not just like a little bit above average life. He said life with all of its fullness. I'm sorry, but that's a life that I really would love to have. He said, I have come in order that you may have life, life in all of its fullness, John 10, 10. Not that you might have religion, but he said that you may have life, that your habit, that that addictions that you have and and hurts and all of these hangups that that you end up having, that you can get free of them, break free of them. 
Jesus doesn't want me to be religious. This is on your sheet. He wants me to be real. Jesus doesn't want me to be religious. You can fill this in. Jesus wants me to be real. Happy are the pure in heart, not the religious in heart. In John 11, we read about the time where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I want us to look at that for a moment. You can go to John 11, John 11, 43. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Because there's a truth here that we need to discover, church. Remember, the Bible doesn't just tell us about the things that God did, but the Bible tells us how God does things. The Bible says in John 11, 43, 44, it says, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who died came out bound hand and foot. I want you to picture that. Dead body, many days, has already gone through this embalming process, and they have prepared the body and the oils and all of this different stuff to help him not to smell. Where they put their grave sites was right in the middle of where community happened. It's the worst thing in the world is to have some rotten, dead flesh being able to permeate the area that you're buying fruit the next day, right? Be like, are these limes fresh? And you're like, what is that smell? And some body's rotting. So they would embalm and have an embalming process, and they would actually have all, um, the frankincense myrrh. It just wasn't for living people. It was for dead people there. So they have already taken the time, embalmed him. They have wrapped him, him in linen. They have tied up his body, okay, hand and foot, and, and, how, and how they do that, you can study that in Jewish culture and how they would do that, okay? He was bound with the grave clothes. He was covered head to toe with no way of whatever was inside the grave clothes of getting out. They wrapped him in such a way that nothing that was inside would be able to sneak out, right? This is bad. I, I'm in hospitals a lot of different times and a lot of different times there's many situations that I kind of have come into that I don't know what it is, but God makes me sort of okay with it. And uh, one time somebody told me, they said, uh, oh, you're here to see such and such in room 117B. And I walk into 117B and I walk in there and there is this dead person. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm too late. It's not the person I was coming to look for. But and I and I go out and I look at the nurses station and I'm like shaking my head going um I'm looking for Smith and they're going oh yeah that's 127B and you're going thanks uh 117's having some issues and, you know walk away but there are some situations where you're just like no way and here we see it says he was bound complete contained there's significance here it means that nothing binds you up and keeps you from the fullness of life like grave clothes do. You try and follow Jesus and you get covered up. You try and make the right decisions, but it keeps you hidden from the rest of the world because there's something there, there's some type of death that's in your life that you don't want anyone to see. Jesus in his life-giving power does not go into your vault. He doesn't go into the secret, secret places of you and, and unbind you from all those shackles and all that different stuff. Instead, he stands outside of your heart. And Jesus says, walk out of there. No, 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 Jesus, you don't understand. No, Jesus says, no, walk out of your heart. All the things that you've, that you've stored away deep and dark places, the grave clothes that are bound all around you, he says, come out. Anybody see the significance of that? Oh, it'd be so simple to say your deepest, darkest dungeon, let Jesus descend into that, unbind you, and you come out and you look better than anyone else around. And when you walk out of your heart, you're just like, yeah, I've been completely free for years. No, Jesus instead says, come out with all that bondage. Come out of your heart. Because if you don't vacate the area in your heart where you've been in bondage, if you don't vacate that area, I can't fill that area. Come on. When you gave your life to Christ, the Bible says that he brought you from death to life. 
It's just like Lazarus that you were brought from death into life. There are still things in your life that can keep you from the fulfillment that Jesus wants for you. As we read just a moment ago, Jesus says, I came to give you the fullness of life, right? In John 10.10. 10. But there are things that bind us up. There are things that hold us back, that restrict us, keep us from finding or reaching our full potential in life with Christ. These are the things that still trip us up over and over and over. Jesus, old ways of thinking, old behaviors, old addictions, all of that kind of stuff. These are the things that trip us up. The mask that we wear, anyone? Do we have a mask sometimes in life? I've been saying it for weeks. We walk into a church, we talk to somebody. I talked about the prayer life of Leonard. That we walk into church and all hell is breaking loose in our life. And we walk in and Leonard goes, hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? You know, and like, not, not very good. Jesus says, I want to set you free from all of this stuff. It's just not enough that him bringing you from death into life. But he wants to bring you into full freedom by calling you out when you've come back alive calling you out and actually taking the grave clothes off of you and saying, now where you occupied with that death and all of those different things, I will now go there. Je Jesus talks about a lot more in John 11. Look toward the end. Jesus says to them, the them there are the disciples, his followers. Jesus says to his followers, you loosen him and you let him go. Remember when we talked about being um, honest with one another and, and, and how in James it talks about that we, should, that we should talk to one another about our sins and hold each other accountable? Jesus models this here, just doesn't say, you do what I say, but he models this where he says, you untie them. Has anyone ever asked for forgiveness from you ever? Have you ever asked for forgiveness from someone else? Spiritually, does it unbind you? Does it free you up? Something that you've been dealing with, it could be something five minutes ago that you did and you have to ask forgiveness, or it could be five years ago and you finally come to the place of asking forgiveness. I did not have a good child home. I had some bad situations. My mom made a lot of bad decisions. She went from using drugs to selling drugs. Family members became abused, all kinds of different things in their life. There was um, full-on, because of, of money and, and the darkness of it, our house got robbed multiple t times um, by my mom and, and different things like that as, as my parents got divorced. And, and there were so much bad issues going on. And for years, every time I would think that something would happen would be good, she would just fall flat again. There would be situations, and, and, and somehow she would always escape jail. She would give somebody else up. Somebody else would go to jail. And, and, and here she was in her uh, late 60s going through rehab. And there she was handling some of these house cleaning choices. And we were on the phone, and we were talking about some uh, medical history or whatever. And I called her on the phone, and she lives in Philadelphia presently. And, and she was there, and she, um, we were talking just a couple different things going on, and, and she stopped for a second, and she says, Timmy, I have to ask you this. I said, sure, what is it? And she just starts bawling. And she says, can you forgive me? And she can't even get past that. She can't say what to forgive about. What, what was the specific thing? What was on her mind? She is just bawling, heaving. I can hear her, and she's not going to stop for hours. And I said, you need to understand that I worship Jesus and he is my Lord and Savior. And before you ever asked me this question, I forgave you at the altar 15 years ago. And she said, what? I said, yeah, I'm not going to bind you up with this because I didn't want it in my life. I had to give it over to the Lord. And I had to say, Jesus, I can't deal with this in my life. I can't constantly, every time I know that she's perpetually going to let me down over and over and deal with the anger every time and deal with the frustration and deal with the hurt and deal with the loneliness and deal with her, her leaving, I can't deal with that. So instead, I just gave it to Jesus. 
Every time something gave, came up, I said, Lord, that is not mine. That's yours because I gave it to you, God. And 15 years later, I'm able to say on the phone, and she just, for years after that phone call, she kept coming back and saying, you forgave me? You forgave me? I can't tell you what that means in my life. I can't tell you what it does internally for me. Come on. Church, let's unbind one another. Oh, I hope they get their life right with Jesus at that altar. This scripture tells me a vastly different story. It says Jesus gives the power to resurrect, and when they come out of the grave, it's up to us to unbind them. I'm sorry, but that's the type of Christianity I want to live. To walk in freedom as a church is for one another of us to help each other walk in freedom, to unbind one another, to loosen them and let them go. Not to loosen them, hold on to the grave clothes and wait until they screw up and then put the grave clothes back on them and bind them tighter this time, right? Oh, you did this. I just unbound you. Let me tie these around your neck pretty tight. Come on. We got those family members and friends around. My friends like them. Who needs an enemy? Galatians 5, 1 talks about what is the picture here we need. It says, it is for freedom that Christ set them free. So why as a church will we bind them up? We need to follow along in freedom, church. We need to do the same things in freedom. Notice he doesn't say, you know, keep a bunch of that stuff hanging around. No, the Lord says, let's free them up fully. Don't leave a, a little bit tied around his ankles. Don't leave the hands tied up. Don't leave the face. He said, let's strip all of it away. Not to bind us or restrict us, because freedom has come through Christ. John 8.36 says, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Satan, I'm sorry that you're trying to trip me up and bind me with the same sin, but I'm free in Jesus' name. And I have friends around me that even if I fall, even if I fall short, they will help me and unbind me and continue in the process of freedom. That sounds good to me. That sounds like I can actually worship God and have a pure heart because I can see God in one another. Not that there's a condemning finger, but there's fingers that are coming to grab the part that's over my eye and pull it down so I may see. Right? Come on. That's a whole lot of loving going on right there. I can't make my own heart pure. Can any of you? Dr. Phil, man, he's good. But Steve Harvey, he's really funny and good. I can't make my own heart pure. Good behavior does not purify my heart. Anyone? Come on. Officer pulls you over, says, do you know why I'm pulling you over? You go, I'm a really good person. <laughs> you know, it doesn't purify you in that moment. <laughs> he goes, yeah, yeah, it's good. You're good in the rest of your life. I'm only looking at one thing. Good behavior doesn't purify your heart. You just can't say, I'm going to clean up my act and behave myself, and I will become pure. That is the oldest lie in the book, right? Good behavior doesn't purify, but a pure heart will change your behavior, church. Remember when I first got saved and I gave my heart to Jesus, there were people that were very close to me around me. I did not dare tell them that I gave my heart to Jesus. I was embarrassed that I had some weak moment in my life that I was going this God route. So people were around me, right? And, and, and I'm in high school, and, and, and one of my buddies really close in, in study hall looked at me and just goes, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, there's something different about you. I was about three weeks after I got saved, and I'm reading the Bible, and he was like, there's something wrong with you. So I couldn't think of anything else to say, so I cursed at him. Do you know how horrible I felt at that moment? That was the first time I really understood cursing was not something that was going to be in my life in the future. 
I cursed at him, and he just like took back and was like, maybe you aren't different, you know? And I'm just like, and inside I'm going, oh gosh, Jesus, I am so sorry. I, did, I never had that. Man, I have cursed people out. I've been like a truck driver. Sailors go running out of a bar. And, and, but this time I just let one fly and I went, ew, this isn't good. Because Christ came to sa save me and set me free. I couldn't purify my own heart. He was purifying me. Not myself. I wasn't doing less bad things. It was my heart and my spirit going, no, you don't need this anymore. This will not feed you. This will not make you who you are. Romans 8, uh, 5, 8 says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Man, that was a monumental scripture to get over. How can some dude that I do not know die for me and my sins? My own mother is not even in my life. Anybody have those things that trip you up? How could a guy who doesn't know me want to deal with my deepest, darkest secrets and heal them and say, I forgive you? Yeah, I don't know what that, that is about. He didn't wait and say, hey, hey, John, you're a big sinner. Clean yourself up and then come to Jesus, okay? I'll be waiting for you, but clean yourself up first. Anyone? Come on. He didn't say that. In, instead, he, he said that while you were sinners, you can't earn salvation. Only Christ can give it to you. You cannot earn it. You cannot buy it. A pure heart will only happen as we surrender to God. Give your life to Christ. That's what the commitment choice last week we talked about. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Anyone who belongs to Christ Jesus has become a new person, right? Has become, not will become, has become a new person. The old life has gone, right? We've said it. We've sang about it in hymns, all kinds of stuff. The old life has gone, and a new life has begun. Jesus says, happy or blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You're still going, I don't see how that's possible. Good. The basis for a pure heart is not being good. The basis for a pure heart is how good God is. I'm sorry, I couldn't clean up my life to save it. And I was very selfish and everything was about me. But I still couldn't do what I needed to do to get my life right. I couldn't think good thoughts. I couldn't act good behavior. Instead, it was only when I gave my heart to Jesus, I gave it all to Him, that He ended up purifying me because of how good God is. God, you've fallen short. No, you haven't. Because my best efforts never, ever could measure up to the bottom rung of your ladder, Lord. It's not how good that I've been. It's how good God is based on His character, not on my character, right? It's based on God's goodness, not yours. Your good behavior can't purify you. But a pure heart will change your behavior. We need to understand that. So my question is, deep down inside, what does your heart want? Do you want God in your life? This is that commitment choice we are talking about each and every day. God, I want you in my life. Well, here's where the Lord comes in. The reason I say this, Psalm 139 says this, You have looked deep into my heart, Lord, and you know all about me. Okay? I want you to stop looking at your heart, and I want you for a moment, take a time where we're going to bow our heads. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Anybody in here? One, two, three. Do we believe in the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Right? We believe in it. So right now, can we do this? Stop looking in your own heart and taking an assessment. Let God speak to you. Bow our heads. Just... Not because it's holy to bow your heads, but I, I want you to really picture your heart. I want you to go into your heart, whether it's, there's a door or it's a valley or it's an open field that you walk into your heart or whatever. Walk into it right now. Take a look at it. And this is our prayer right now. Lord, 
what do you say as the Scripture says that you've looked into my heart? What are the areas, God, that I'm still holding on to and haven't cleaned house? God, show me. Some of you, the Lord just revealed it to you. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, keep doing the work. You're not showing us how bad we are, but you're showing us areas of our heart that you want us to let go of. There's a hurt that someone has done against us. Lord, you're bringing that to the surface. There's madness and chaos that we have created in somebody else's life, and we have just ran over them. And we realize right now that we're convicted and that we need to ask for forgiveness. I feel like the Lord is speaking that to somebody right now. Some of you, there's an abuse right now that the Lord is bringing to the forefront. It's His Holy Spirit. You're thinking to yourself, i got to get rid of this. You're right. Holy Spirit, help us right now. Help us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we surrender to You. We surrender that Your promises and You will purify our hearts. That right now, Lord, if You, if you can allow us to picture, Lord Jesus, that we take our own hearts in our hands and we put our little hands in Yours, Lord God, and we uncup our heart and drop our heart right into Your hands, Lord God. Thank You, Lord Jesus, right now. Thank You, Lord Jesus. Anybody feel the sense? You can open up your eyes. Just allow the Holy Spirit to continue to speak to you. If you feel like the Lord has spoken to you just now, come on. Anybody in here, we, can, we don't have to tell me what it is. Just that the Lord, let's confirm that the Holy Spirit just spoke to us. Anyone? I'm raising my hand because I'm part of this. Yes, Lord just spoke to me, okay? Anybody else? Remember we said we need to be honest? Anybody else in here? Come on, let's be honest. Has the Lord just spoken to you and revealed something to you that is an area that He wants you to do house cleaning with, that has been there, and you're like, uh, anyone? Guess we have a perfect church. The Bible says in Romans 4, 17, God calls things that were not as though they were. He sees you right now as Christ already sees you as having a pure heart. He sees you as this way. Anybody ever seen uh, David, uh, Michelangelo, Michelangelo's David? Ever seen that? So there's a, a long story. It's a beautiful story of it. Someone actually asked Michelangelo, how did, you, how did you make David? How did you cut out this statue of David? How did it happen? And he says, all I did is I started with a block of stone and I cut away everything that wasn't David. I love that. Because the Lord sees us in all of our sin and all of our ugliness and all of that, and the Lord says, I just cut everything away that is not my child. He's not revealing it to you so that you can be harmed or He can wag His finger in your face, but that we're a giant block of stone and we're just a big ugly rock sometimes, but the master craftsman Jesus cuts away everything that is not what He wants in our life. But if we're that big block of stone, there has to be something that we do. We have to yield to Him. Imagine Michelangelo's knocking off big chunks of this, right? And right there, an arm comes out, picks up a chunk, and pulls it back on and going, I didn't give you permission to do that. You know, he's kind of freaked out and going, yeah, but I'm trying to make this statue and going, yeah, but I'm not comfortable with you doing that. We have to be yielded to the Lord, church. In the same process, 
as the Lord is chiseling away and, and the mind of the Creator is looking at you and saying, these are the things that He brought forward in, in that exercise that we did, a spiritual exercise that He brought to the forefront. This is the part where He's chipping and saying, will you allow me to pull that away? Some of you are saying, no, restitution hasn't happened. That person hasn't forgiven me. That person has died and I will never be free of this. And the Lord's saying, no, yield. Let me take that chunk away from you. It's just not helping you be what I created you to be. Cooperate with the process that I'm doing in your life. Cooperate. I want to encourage you, church. If you fall down after this Sunday and we're, and we're doing this deep spiritual exercise, if you fall down, get back up. If you fall down again, get back up. If you fall down yet again, get back up. Because this is where God's people know that God comes in, that he has forgiveness, he has grace for you. Don't, don't lay there. He loves you. He wants others, remember we talked about the grave clothes? He wants others to go and help pick you back up. When you fail, when you sin, when you fall, confess it, repent of it, and move forward. Right? Oh, I really messed up that time. Confess of it, repent of it, and move forward. How many times have, have we done that? Don't let sin keep you from God. When you do that, you're just playing into the devil's hands. He wants to separate you from God. Anybody know that? Satan wants to separate you from God. Don't let your sin drive you from the Lord. Because that's the only place that you're going to find forgiveness. Satan wants to keep you away from God. Because he knows that God's going to forgive you. He knows the character and nature of God. So he drives you far away from that. And says, no, 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 this sin has to keep you from God. God doesn't want you. And what he's doing is trying to separate you so that you cannot be forgiven and made free. When you sin, don't run from God. 1 John, the promises in 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Come on. Don't misunderstand me here. God is not soft on sin. We're in a big political climate right now, and, and there's all these crazy things going on. Korea, ZTE, everybody's micromanaging the, the President Trump and all these things and scrutinizing. He had Wheaties for breakfast. He should have eaten cornflakes. Doesn't he know about the Midwest and the corn epidemic? No, I don't know. Like, come on. But here, don't misunderstand me. God is not easy on sin. He's not some old man winking his eye and saying, oh, that sin's no big deal. It is a big deal. There is one thing that I know that God hates. He hates sin. But he doesn't hate the sinner. We need to understand that. We need to separate that. It's what separates us from God. I see somebody do something wrong, I join them with their sin and call them bad. Anyone? You guys are perfect human beings. I see somebody doing bad choices. I see somebody doing drugs over and over and over again. I call them a druggie. God calls them redeemed. God calls them saved. God calls them forgiven. But no, I, I call it out because I see the sin, so I combine the person with the sin. And I always talk about who they are by their sin. Anyone? Come on. We label the people by their sin. God doesn't. When I go to the Lord and I'm ready to just empty my heart and say, man, I'm just the ugliest that I have been, God says, hello, my child. I love you. I'm like, well, wait, God, you got to love me after I get rid of all this ugliness. And he goes, no, I love you. Not because of who you are right now, but because of who I died for. So the fourth choice, the idea of examining our heart and confessing, Lamentation says this, let us search our ways. Let us search our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us search our ways. Why does the Lord want us to search our ways? He wants to search our hearts. Why does he take this kind of inventory for us? Because in, in Luke 7, 47, Jesus says, he who has forgotten little 
loves little. He who has forgotten, uh, forgiven little, loves little. Excuse me. He who has forgiven little, loves little. So if we don't realize the true potential of how God has saved us and set us free, we truly can't love people. I want to finish out with these three things. First of all, we need to remember God's kindness. God's kindness. Romans 2.4 says, God's kindness leads you towards repentance. Romans 5.8 says, continues, God has shown us how much he loves us, that it was while we were still sinners that he died for us. Second thing I want you to remember is God's faithfulness. Remember God's faithfulness. Philippians 1.6, I am convinced that God who began this work in you will carry it through to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, in Romans 8 it says, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love that God has in Christ Jesus. The last thing is remember God's promises. It says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us, to purify us. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this, I will give you a new heart. I love that. Thank you, Jesus. He says, I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That is everything that we're talking about here. These are God's promises. Be like, no, Lord, I've really messed things up this time. And he says, no, it doesn't matter because I'm in the trading business. I trade ashes, right, that you have in your life. It's scriptural. I give you beauty for the ashes that you have. Fear, I give you strength. I love in Ezekiel there, it says, your heart of stone, I'll give you a heart of flesh. Second Corinthians says, for it is Christ who is the yes to all God's promises. I want you to take courage right now that God's at work in you. Amen? God's at work in you. You don't have to be afraid. Just follow him. Just search him out. Just do the house cleaning choice and say, Lord, what are the things that are in me that you don't want? And stop asking, am I okay? Yeah, I'm okay. But actually ask the Lord, Lord, what is it that you're you're doing? What is it that you want in my life? Let's pray right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. And we pray, Heavenly Father, right now in Jesus' name, that as we move forward with you, we expect to see freedom in our life because of your promises, because of your kindness, because of your faithfulness, Lord God. You have not brought us out this far, Lord God, to bring us back into captivity. But Lord Jesus, right now, I speak freedom and wholeness and love and forgiveness over these people right now. And as they go, Lord Jesus, may they search out the people that you have revealed to them. May, may, as you put things on their heart, Lord Jesus, may we go and make time to handle things right now in Jesus' name. And we just love you and thank you. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. God bless you, Life Chapel. God bless you, those online. If you guys uh, need any of the additional materials, we have a devotional guide that is uh, going through the week that you continue, continue to read and to know uh, more of what God has for you. So um, just remember all of those things this week and, and make sure, go out there and, and, and just be the best that you can be by following the Holy Spirit's leading. Not follow your own leading, but the Holy Spirit's leading as he spoke to some of you in here today. Amen? Amen. God bless you. We'll see you all next week.